Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, August 27, 2016, and this is the week in charts. All right, there's a disclaimer screen. I know I kind of zipped by it. You can, you can go read it on my website if you like. Um, one of these days, I'm going to put a bunch of uh, crazy stuff in there just to see if somebody actually <laughs> does read it, which I think would be kind of a, kind of fun to do, so I might actually do that. Anyway, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That's basically all you need to know when it comes to disclaimers. But obviously, read the rest of that for um, lawyer purposes. What are we going to talk about? Well, as usual, same things we always talk about. Current market conditions, your questions on trading, and your favorite stock picks. Now, the main thing I want to pick up, um, talk about, oh, by the way, with the stock picks, if you don't mind, wait until we get to the charts. And to those who are a little newer to the show, ask about one stock at a time and hit enter. You can ask about a dozen stocks. You can ask about 100 stocks. Just make sure you hit enter so once I talk about that ticker, I can delete it off the list and keep track. So this week, we're going to talk about the real secret of trading. Well, not quite as exciting as it sounds, but it's it's true. And... Unfortunately, the bad news is it's not going to be easy for highly motivated people like you. I don't think you'll see what I'm talking about. So the real secret to trading is, is patience. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about patience as it applies to this particular market. But there's two forms of patience. And I've been working on an intro course for quite a while. And I'm spending a lot of time on patience, and it's kind of ironic. I'm to the point where I, I'm in the course where I've gotten to where I'm going to talk about patience, and then now's the time in the market where you really need to be patient. So it's kind of interesting how that all dovetails in. So when it comes to trading, you really need two forms of patience. The patience to wait for your pitch and the patience to let things unfold once you take the setup. And both are vitally important, but right now – the most important one is the patience to wait for your pitch. Now, a lot of times in markets, you're thinking that it's ready, set, and action. But a lot of times, there is no action to be taken. And as I often say, trading done properly can often be quite boring. That was a bit of an epiphany for one of my clients who – seem to be seeking action in the markets. And that really helped him to recognize that. I said, look, let's just follow this plan. And he's like, well, it's kind of boring. I'm like, exactly. It's like, oh, okay, well, I'll go play golf or I'll run my business and let these trades unfold. And if there's nothing to do, I'm not going to do anything. I'll let you keep chipping away at it. I'll let you do the research for me. And I'm not going to make a bunch of trades. I'm going to wait until conditions are conducive. And it's kind of interesting. Lately, I've been thinking about patience and writing about patience and putting together slides of the course about patience. And I, I do think there's this big thing or these laws of attraction and perception are very important. And I found a bunch of quotes. I wasn't seeking, seeking them. I wasn't actively seeking them. But they just sort of came to me over the last week or so as it regards to patience. And one of the things – that and I'm a huge fan of this attraction and perception thing. How, how many yellow cars did you see today? And that's going to probably be a hard question for you to, to answer. When I was uh, when my daughter was much younger, she had a friend, and they would play a yellow car and yellow car or yellow automobile, however you want to phrase it, is that it's kind of like Volkswagen Punchback, you know. You, If you see a yellow car, you're like, yellow car, you have to call it. And the first person to see, or you get a point every time you see a yellow car. Well, they would play this in the back seat. And I was shocked at how many yellow cars there were. The, the day before they started playing this game, I didn't remember seeing any. But now I see a lot of yellow cars. So I think the laws of attraction are very important. And I don't want to go all uh, – esoteric on you, but I think that just make sure you're attracting the right sort of things 
into your trading, into your life in general for that matter. But I don't want to go freshman psychology on you. But I think it's kind of cool that here I am writing about patience, thinking about patience, talking about patience. And then all of a sudden I start seeing these quotes just appear on Facebook. Uh, this one I got from the Kirk Report. I spend a lot of time researching things we ultimately don't do. Well, heck, that's me. And it's hard to spend a couple hours or more every day looking at a whole bunch of charts. And after all was said and done, a lot more was said than done. There's nothing to do. And that's tough. And a while back, I actually had a client, and I, I talked about this a few months ago, back in February, I think. I had a client email me. He's like, eh, Dave, I think I'm going to take a break. There's, I don't see anything on the horizon, given the nature of this market. And I told him, I was like, wow, I can't argue with you. But I can say, after doing this for a very long time, that you never really know when that next opportunity is going to come along. And the next day, or that night, I should say, for the next day, I literally found two setups. And I didn't think there was a setup I'd be able to find a setup to save my life. I, I agreed with him. And then I found two setups that he turned into two big winners, and one of which were still actually long in the portfolio. And that was all the way back in February. So that's, what, eight months We've been in this one little swing trade that turned into a nice little intermediate term trade. So that's one of the hard parts of the methodology is you never know when that next setup is coming along. As a general statement, you probably shouldn't trade in the summer. You should say, all right, well, let's just go to the beach. Forget about my charts. But every now and then you get some really good stocks that set up during the, during the summer. So the market doesn't necessarily work on your time frame. But this is me. I spend a lot of time researching things we ultimately don't do. But that's okay because you never know when the next big winner is going to come along. And we're going to get to a decision tree in a little while. It's going to help you with that. Doing nothing is harder than it looks. And that's going to be quite a bit of today's presentation. And Tom Petty, as I wrote in the Layman's Guide to Trading Stocks, says the waiting is the hardest part. Charlie Munger says, another quote that I got just because I was uh, over the last week, because I think that my perception, my laws of attraction were working with me because I was thinking about being patient. And I was thinking a lot of how this market is just kind of chopping around sideways. Charlie Munger once said, it takes, a little, it takes character to sit there with all that cash and do nothing. I didn't get where I am by going after mediocre opportunities. Charlie Munger's worth a billion here, a billion there, two billion maybe. Not that I'm a fan of his style of money management, but it seems to have worked okay for him. Last week I poised the question, why do the same people who seek perfection in life settle for such mediocrity in markets? Why can't they wait? Why can't they be patient? Why do they trade such crappy charts? And even in good markets, sometimes they seem to be willing to settle for mediocrity. Now, before I get into that, I got to thinking about it right before the show. And in my little dress rehearsal, I kind of digress when I got to this slide, but I think it's a it's a good tangent to go on. Way back when I was working on my undergraduate degree in a mathematics class, there was this um, little Asian instructor, uh, nice gentleman. Um, I'd say older, but now that I'm older, maybe he wasn't that old. <laughs> and he would always say over and over again, if you don't know what the answer is, then you, then you write down question mark. And it was kind of quirky at the time, but it now kind of makes a lot of sense to me. And one day in class, he wrote down some big equation, and he goes equals, and there was like dead silence in the room. 
And I shouted out, question mark. And he goes, yes. And he got all excited and pointed to me and the whole class had a good laugh. But now I kind of understand where he was going with that. You have to ask questions. And sometimes the first part of that process is to literally write down a question mark in a notebook. And I often do that when I'm trying to figure something out. So I think it's important to ask questions of yourself, but make sure you're asking the right questions. And this goes for trading and in life too. Don't ask yourself, why do I suck? <laughs> you know, but maybe ask yourself what small step I could take to improve this process. What could I do? And it's kind of interesting. I've always been a fan of, of asking questions and what I don't know, what I'm going to put in a course. So when I don't know what to do, I, I either ask myself, well, if I did know, what would I do? That's one thing that I often will do. Or I'll just start with the question mark process and start saying, well, what do I want to put into it? OK, instead of being like, I don't know what to do. Just like, well, what should I do? What do I do? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Vegas speaking at the Traders for a Cause conference. And the first day of the conference, they spent a lot of time, to my surprise, on trading psychology. And I really thought they were going to be – they were predominantly day traders, although the group is growing and broadening out, which is kind of exciting. A very uh, interesting, highly educated, motivated group of people. But there are a lot of day traders in the bunch. And I, I was surprised that they – I was thought well, I'd look through a bunch of um, level two screens and – oscillators and all kinds of things on day on the first day of the conference I was speaking day two and to my surprise they spent the whole day virtually the whole day talking about trading psychology and they actually had Dr. Robert Mara come in uh, he's a PhD in psychology I believe and uh, my apologies and I should know I have his book right here or one of his books and he gave a really good speech and he talked about a lot of things that I'm into uh, as far as like the brain research and I spend with little spare time I do have when I'm not relaxing, I try, I try to spend working on how the, how the brain works, why we do what we do. And obviously that's framed within how it relates to trading. But anyway, he's uh, this is a really good book. You could, you could probably read it if you just give yourself uh, a little time in one setting. It's a little small book, but it's a very great book. It's called How One Small Step Can Change Your Life, The Kaizen Way. And he actually has a chapter on there in there, which kind of dovetails in with my thinking. And it's just a little chapter on asking small questions. So where am I going with all this? Well, it's interesting to me, and it never ceases to amaze me, that if you ask questions, you will get answers. So last week, I poised the question, why do the same people who seek perfection in life settle fudge for such, fudge? For such, that might be a good word, fudge, uh, for such mediocrity in markets? Now, I pick on the doctors, and then I think engineers are probably a close second. But I, I pick on the doctors because it seems like they make the absolute worst traders, and I've tried to wrap my head around that. And I've got a few theories here and there, uh, one of which is that you're going to be wrong a lot in trading, and, and, and if you're a doctor, you can't be wrong that much. But yesterday, yesterday, last week, I poised the question, why do the same people who seek perfection in life settle, settle for such mediocrity markets? And guess what? I got the answer. And this got me to thinking. Maybe it's not your fault why you're struggling in trading, why you have issues with trading. Maybe you received 10, 20, 30 or more years, years should be in here, of bad trading right here, of bad training. Well, I'm sorry. Let's start over that. It's not your fault. Maybe you have received... 10, 20, 30, or more years of bad training for trading. And I'm basing that on the answer that I got. 
I think I can answer the question about why highly trained and skilled professionals can't seem to get the chart reading slash trading thing. I am a physician who specializes in psychiatry. It's like psychiatry. <laughs> Doctors, boy, my mouth is not working today. Doctors, lawyers, and mechanics are trained to take whatever train wreck comes along and fix it. As if you've been a fan of the show, you know that I often say if you're a doctor or a lawyer or automatic transmission mechanic, it might take you a little bit longer due to some of the aforementioned reasons. One of which is logic doesn't always apply. Doctors, lawyers, and mechanics are trained to take whatever train wreck comes along and fix it. We are expected to do something immediately regardless of the conditions and despite the possible negative outcomes of our action. As a physician, if you dwell too much on the potential negative outcomes, you will become a deer in the headlights and not be able to function. So we tend to minimize the negative aspects of the situation. Waiting for the perfect pitch is not what we are trained to do. And that's kind of interesting because I often talk about waiting for the perfect pitch. I'm not a big baseball fan, although I have been tuning in a little bit to the Cubs because um, I have a new friend from Chicago, and he's a pretty big Cubs fan. I guess most people in Chicago are. <laughs> uh, but a perfect pitch, the fat pitch, the so-called fat pitch, I did a little Googling on that a while back after I stayed in the Holiday Inn Express. And it says that to a hitter, the fat pitch looks like a, a cabbage ball coming at you, a softball, just a huge fat ball coming at you. That's what it looks like in their mind's eye, or that's what they perceive. So we can't sit around and wait for that fat pitch, or highly trained people, I should say, have a hard time doing that. And then Dr. J went on to say, we have no training to prepare us for sitting on our hands and waiting. It's simply not part of the mindset. So there's your answer. Why doctors, lawyers, and automatic transmission mechanics have a hard time trading. They're trained not for trading. They're trained for their profession to take whatever mediocrity is thrown at them and do something with it. They're not trained to say, well, your transmission needs replacing. I don't feel like doing that. Let's, let's just move on. Okay. You're too, you're a little too effed up. I don't want to mess with you. You're just, you're just batshit. So we can't uh, deal with you. So you get the idea. Now, when it comes to markets, as I often say, you want to obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. Now, this simple little thing I just threw out one time, and it's kind of stuck. It's caught on. There's a couple things in here. One, that kind of goes back to the patience before, and then two, it goes back to patience after. People tend to micromanage their trades, and I, I spoke a lot about micromanagement a few weeks ago. So if you get really bored, you're having – trouble sleeping at night, check out those videos. Like uh, Greg Moore says, uh, just don't operate any heavy machinery afterwards. So you really want to obsess before you get into trade. So that's what we're kind of focusing on today. And garbage in, garbage out, as I often say. So you want to make sure you're in the best trades to begin with. And sometimes the best action is no action. So how do you know when to be patient before the trade? Well, the simplest of all simple things is the net-net change. But it amazes me, and this is probably what led me into that mediocrity speech and, and where we are today from last week, is that it amazes me, I'll show, or people will show me a price chart where a stock, yes, it's been trending over the long term, but over the past two to three months has done absolutely nothing. It's going completely sideways. And it's a net-net change. Now, one thing that i kind of been thinking about, kind of anticipating a question, is that you don't necessarily know that the market is doing this until it does that. So there is a lot of hindsight in the net net. However, let's say you're four weeks in and it's unchanged from where it was, okay, four weeks ago. 
let's say you're eight weeks in, okay, and it's unchanged from where it was eight weeks ago, then maybe, quite maybe, the market is going sideways. And then maybe, quite maybe, you might want to reevaluate your taking action. But remember, if you're a highly trained, highly motivated individual, you're, you're trained to take action. And this goes completely against the grain. This goes against your training, against your life, against your motivation. Okay. So your best friend doing choppy markets is your sideways, is the sideways arrow. So let's take a look at the S&P 500. And if you look at the S&P 500 over the past four months, three, four months, you can go all the way back to last summer. on July 11th, and you could see where it was, and then obviously we could see where it was yesterday. We can see where it is today if we want, okay? But you can see there's a big blue arrow in there pointing sideways. So you might not know right here that the market is gonna end up here three or four months down the road, but right now you know that it has been going sideways. So you're going to have to really, and we're going to get to the decision tree in just one second. But now you know, and if you've been following along my service and I've been boring the heck out of you, by the way, I'm proud of my clients now. They're hanging in there in spite of me telling them to do nothing every day. I'm getting a couple of people come in on trial and then bored them to death and they quit. But that, that happens even in really good conditions. But it seems like years ago, I guess all my preaching and beating a dead horse, but years ago, clients would really drop off. In fact, going way, way back in time, way back to the trading markets days, when I first uh, did a service with them, they had, by default, they asked me to do a service. I'm like, okay, what the heck? Might as well. I'm doing research anyway. And they actually had salesmen that were marketing it, and they would call me up and say, Dave, you've got to recommend something. We're losing clients. But what's interesting is if I were recommending crap and the portfolio was tanking, they would – we wouldn't lose clients, or not many at least. Not as many as you would think. So that taught me that people are craving action. But instead of giving them what they want, I decided, well, I'm going to give them what they need. And what they need is they need to know to sit in their hands. And it took me a long time to learn how to do that. So the point, and it's taken me a long way to get, to, a long time to get there. The point is that don't forget about the net net price change. And 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 don't worry if you're newer to these presentations. I won't beat you up too bad. Somebody did email me. You never like any of my stocks. It's like, well. Are you paying attention? <laughs> but I won't beat you up uh, too bad if I don't recognize your name if you're the first uh, few times in here. But when we get to the charts in a few minutes, you're going to see I'm going to probably get asked about a lot of stocks that on a net-net basis have gone nowhere. So it's like I asked my wife, hey, what you think about my column? She goes, well, I say a lot of the same shit. And it's like, well, you know, I'm going to keep saying a lot of the same shit until you people get it. But I do have a lot of people, for some reason, they can't wrap their head around this net, net, and that's why I talk about it so much. So when it comes to trading, you have to make that to trade or not to trade decision. And that's tough. If you're highly motivated, you feel like you got to go in there, grind it out, grind it out, grind it out, grind it out. And that simply isn't true. Sometimes there's nothing to do. So I made this, this decision tree which has found its way into the intro course and has also found its way into a couple of webinars. So bear with me if you've seen it before. But you want to ask yourself, when you're doing your analysis, can you walk away and be okay? So the first thing you ask yourself is, are conditions generally conducive? Okay. Dave, what does that mean? Well, it means that if you're looking at the market, you could draw a big blue arrow, 
and it's going higher. Blue because my paint program defaulted to blue many years ago and then it stuck. So I'm known as a guy who draws a big blue arrow. Somebody once told me to stick them up my butt and said I was a trend following moron. Well, they were short a huge position and they were on the cusp of blowing up. And that's why they tell me what to do with them. And that just was more testament. I mean, I was a little offended at the time because I respected the person. But now I'm like, hey, you know what? He's right. I am a trend following moron. So is the market headed higher? Is the sector headed higher? Is the stock that you're looking to trade headed higher? And then there needs to be a fourth arrow in here. Are the stocks within the sector generally trading higher? Okay. So if conditions are generally conducive, you've got all that firepower, so to speak, behind you. By default, the market you choose, provided it's going up along with all those other sectors and markets and other stocks in the sector, then you probably you probably should trade. You probably have something that's worthwhile. Now, are conditions generally conducive? Well, if the market looks like an electrocardiogram, as it does now, chopping back and forth, and by the way, that's where you have to really be careful not to chase your own tail. It's like if you read the headlines, I, I never read further than the headlines, but if you read the headlines on a big update, it's like, all is clear, all is great, earnings are great, buyouts, buyouts, buyouts. And then on a down day, it's like, oh, market, uh, market's failing. It's, it's done. It's over. So if you're just following price, you got to be careful not to chase your own tail. But if you're following these headlines, you really got to be careful. But if the market is just chopping around, as it has been lately, FYI, how do I know? Well, because I could draw a big sideways blue arrow. Where were we on July 11th? 2100 and change. Where are we now? 2100 and change. Oh, well, we haven't gone anywhere, have we? Now, if the market is bouncing around, looks like electrocardiogram, do you think you have the mother of all setups? And this is where you have to be honest and not look for that mediocrity and try to make something out of mediocrity. Hey, I'm going to write that down. You should write that down too. Don't try to make something out of mediocrity. But if you do have the mother of all setups, then trade. And this is kind of this kind of goes back to what I was saying a little while ago when someone said, Dave, market conditions are crappy. I, for the life of me, can't see when we'll ever have another setup. And I'm like, you know what? I cannot argue with that. I certainly can't argue with that. But I'm going to keep chipping away at it because I never know when that next setup is going to come along. And again, not to beat the dead horse, but they did that particular night. It triggered over the next couple of days. So if you do think you have the mother of all setups, even though – you might be swimming against the tide a little bit, or if there is no tide, I should say, then you need a trade. And if you don't think you have the mother of all setups, then you need to walk away, but be okay. Now, that's the hard part, and I added this part in this morning, which I thought would be important, because recently I was going through my scans, and I saw one that I think you guys probably have brought up recently, and I kind of picked it apart a little bit as to why I didn't like it. Well, now it's up about 100%. And initially, I get that cringing feeling, and this kind of goes back to that deliberate practice thing we talked about last week, and I'm sure we will revisit quite often. But I was bummed out. I'm like, oh, man, that stock was on my radar a couple of months ago. So what do I do? I look back and says, oh, I, it actually had the chart kind of marked up. It might come up later in a, in a presentation if we have time. And I'm like, oh, well, I remember why I didn't like it, because the sector wasn't so hot at the time. The stock, eh, it, it, it was an okay setup, but it was mediocre at best. So the overall market was mediocre at best. So I decided to pass. Now, we talked about perception a little while ago. But in the markets, there's a big danger of selective perception. A lot of times you'll be, if you're, if you're newer to trading and you're designing a system, guess what? 
you're going to see those perfect signals where the stock went up 100%. And you're going to think, wow, that's fantastic. Well, because they jump out at you. They stick out like a sore thumb. But what you're not going to see is the 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe 100 trades in between where it didn't work. So, yeah, initially it's a little aggravating to see that I let one get away. It's the, like the Chinese proverb, the fish that got away. But you have to realize for every one that got away, there were probably a dozen you would have lost your butt on. And that one trade would not have made up for that. You would be in sheep dip big time had you grinded it out and taken all those mediocre setups. So, and that's the tough part is being willing to forego that one trade. And lately, I don't know if you guys have been looking at a lot of charts, but I've been amazed at the amount of debacle du jours. And very easily, a mediocre setup could have turned into one of these debacle du jours. I'm talking about stocks just getting absolutely annihilated. So that's yet another testament as to why we shouldn't be doing a lot of trading right now. But psychologically, it could be tough, one, because you're motivated, and two, because you feel like you're missing the boat. You feel like you're missing the action. And I put myself under a lot of pressure because I know that people are depending upon me. But I put myself under a lot of pressure to make sure I leave no stone unturned and make sure there's no opportunity that I'm missing. And then I have to weigh that very carefully with doing nothing if there's nothing to do. So be willing to walk away and be okay. And that's not easy for uh, highly motivated people. Phil says, I did a two-day seminar with Robert Myra around in 1990 in L.A. He was outstanding. Didn't know he had a book. Yeah, he's actually got a few books out there. And I, I don't – I've got to find a piece of paper. Uh, this, would, this one I made a note on because several people at the conference said, you got to read this book. And I wrote it down. And uh, he, he, he passed out a sheet of paper with, like, several books on it. Start with this one. I'm sure some uh, Googling, you'll find the rest. But this one is uh, quite excellent. And, again, the name of it is The Kaizen Way. I've got to get my um, my Amazon reference account back up and running again because I used to put all these books that I read up on the website. And I'm, and I'm kind of slacked in that, especially since I put the new website website up. But uh, it's an easy read. Even though he's a he's a very smart gentleman, he, he writes it a very – um, folksy kind of way, I guess, for lack of a better word. Not to insult him, but I, I mean it as a compliment. But, yeah, good little book. Definitely read it. Um, yeah, uh, email me on that, Phil. What uh, I'm, what type of uh, work you were doing that you would do a seminar with him? You know, uh, and this, again, a lot of his speech is going to find its way into my work because he talked about, like, the amygdala and all, and that's something that I've written quite a bit about. And he's got me thinking about that in a lot more details, but he gave a really good speech about uh, how your emotions work and how your emotions are very quick and you make these snap decisions. And I'm spending a lot of time embracing that and adding a lot of his work into, into what I'm doing and, uh, and giving him ample credit, but yeah, great. Um, he's a really good speaker too. Uh, funny, entertaining, just phenomenal. So uh, kudos to him. But, yeah, uh, Phil, shoot me an email on that. I'd like to uh, explore that a little further with you. Okay. Dave, this is a great call. If we use a shorter arrow, like from mid-August rather than July, it would look like a downward trend. What is the direction of the period for your arrow? Well, the direction of the period of the arrow depends, okay? And that's a good question. I'm glad you asked it because I've, I've sort of anticipated that. And this is where people sometimes get in trouble is that they might say, well, Dave, July, we were down at 2,000, and then right now we're up at uh, – I didn't do a good job drawing that. July, we're down at 2,000, and then now we're at 2,125. So that's a pretty good move. And to that I say I agree, but in markets it becomes what have you done for me lately? So the question is what is the correct time period? Well, first – just start looking at several days, okay? So let's look at the last look at the last five days, and then look at the last five weeks, and then look at the last five months, okay? So 
a lot of times, and this is something I talked about last week. If you get a chance, go in and watch last week's webinar when we talked about deliberate practice. And um, and I'm working. I'm working. By the way, the name of that book was Peak, or is still Peak. Uh, I'm working my way through. I'm about halfway done on that one too. Uh, one day I'm going to pick up a book and read it cover to cover, and then start a new book. <laughs> That'll probably never happen. I'm reading about 50 books right now. It's just my nature. But one thing we talked about last week was that you have to be careful not to look at from here to here, from A to B, when there's also this happening. So you have to always ask yourself, is the trend decelerating? Okay. Is the trend accelerating? Okay. Or, and then obviously the third one is, is there no trend? So to answer your question, yes, you want to look at the daily, you want to look at or the, the interday charts, and then you want to look at uh, charts going back several weeks and then charts going back several months. So look at everything and get a feel for what's going on. But as a trend follower right now, this is not a trend you want to follow. Now, keep in mind, we still have an open portfolio, and some of our stocks look exactly like this. So do we bail out? No. Obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. Just let it unfold. This might turn into the mother of all consolidations, or we might get stopped out. But we're going to let things unfold. Life gets a lot easier when you stop trying to figure it all out and let it unfold. Once you put a trade on, let it unfold. I know, easier said than done. I was why I literally had to turn off the screen screens right as I was starting this presentation. I've got one thing that's working really great for me, and I've got another thing that is as going against me. And the two are just one is one is keeping the other one afloat, and the other one's dragging the whole portfolio down. It's pissing me off. This is on the Forex trade, not stocks, in case you're wondering. But I've got to turn that screen off and resist the, the urge to micromanage myself out of one or two of these other positions. So I still have these same human urges. And I still – this would, I think this is what helps me to write about psychology. And maybe part of my writing is to uh, – it's my own therapy, okay? So it's hard. But let things unfold once you get in and when they begin to go sideways. There's really nothing to do. And you're going to find that longer term, you're going to catch a lot more winners and do a lot better. Okay. The market will drive you nuts, which for some of us is a short trip. He actually didn't say that. He just said, the market will drive you nuts if you think you could determine market direction. Best to relax, relax and accept the market direction is unknown. Absolutely. And, and that's the problem that highly successful and highly motivated people have is that they need to know, and a lot of times through control, they need to control the situation, and they need to know what is the probable outcome, uh, probably like to a, to a degree of, of 1% or even greater, okay? You can't crash 1% of your planes and say that you're a great pilot 99% of the time, Okay. Depending on the surgery, and I don't want to speak too much for doctors, but they might be a they might be a, a, a minor surgery that has a very 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 high success rate. Even if you're wrong, maybe one tenth of percent of the time, you kill kill one out of a thousand patients. That's too many, you know. But in trading, you have no control over that. And Mark Douglas once said, "Pardon my French, ladies," he said, "All it takes is one asshole to screw up a perfectly good trade." Okay. And you have no control over that person. I made a joke at the conference because like a lot of the guys at the conference, these day traders shorting these parabolic moves. Well, some of these stocks we were actually in, these parabolic stocks. And uh, it's like, well, all it takes is one Hales group of perfectly good trade. It's, it's nice to meet you. So it's good to get out to realize there's a lot of other people out there that think they're right, that are trading the markets. And these people could actually – be going against your trades. The other thing to realize is quoting Tom McClellan, or his more specifically his wife, not his wife, I'm sorry, his his late mother, his uh, father's 
X, Y. Um, oh, goodness. I'm butchering this. <laughs> Tom McClellan's late mother, Marion, once said that people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. Some people buy when they have money. Some people sell when they need money. And then others use far more sophisticated methods. So you have no control over all these people. And giving up control is hard. Letting things unfold is hard. But sometimes doing nothing, this is the second part of that patience, which I didn't really plan on getting into today, but we're here. That second part of the patience is letting things unfold, letting the market make decisions for you. And as one of my slides that I have put in the intro course says, this is going to be the hardest, easiest thing that you have ever done. It's hard to let things just unfold but it's exactly what you should do. And a lot of times it's going to end badly. Get over it. All trades, as I often say, are going in badly. In the end, you're going to give up something. Okay. Get over it. It comes to the territory. Once you wrap your head around all this stuff, I'll tell you quite frankly, it does not become easy. I've, I've seen, I've seen friends of mine who run billions of dollars have some pretty ugly drawdowns. And I don't call them up and go, hey, how's that feel? Because I know how that feels, right? But I know that they're probably not feeling that great at that time. They still have feelings just because they decided to become a trader and run a whole bunch of money. Doesn't mean that they don't still have a pulse. So wrap your head around all of that and wrap your head around letting things unfold. And then wrap your head around sometimes it's going in badly. You have no control over that. The only thing you can't control is you. And again, obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. Garbage in, garbage out. I can't really find a setup to save my life right now. Okay. And if you think you have something, show me. Let's well, let's 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 pick it apart. Maybe you do. Okay. But for the most part, I'm not finding a whole lot of setups. By the way, the number of setups you're seeing. Could be quite telling too, provided that you've put in a few reps, provided that you've looked at charts for a while and you know what you're looking for. And especially if you're looking for something fairly specific, such as like in my case, a pullback or an emerging trend. If you have 100 setups and you're having a hard time willing those setups down, then you should trade. OK, if like me lately, I've had 10 setups. And then every time I go through my so-called Landry list, I knock off one or two stocks to a point where it's like, well, let me stop going through the list. So at least I have something to show my people and frame it within. This is all I could find. And if I went through it any further, we'd have zero on a list for tomorrow. But don't do anything. I just want to show you I've done my homework and this is what we found. All right. Oh my goodness. Okay. We'll take a look at that in a minute, Angelo. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, Angela is an interesting story. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but that's kind of interesting. Susan says market's still at 20,015 levels. We'll take a look at that. All right, let's hop out to the charts. Uh, you guys want to start asking questions about individual stocks? That's fine. And uh, we'll get to some of those comments in one second. Good stuff. Keep them flowing. Let's take a look at the overall market again. Okay, S&P 500. One thing I do want to do, one thing I do want to do is to, to zoom in on the the intraday action. Oop, wrong button. And it's been down, up, up, down, down, up down down up this morning now it's down so keep an eye on the the daily changes and notice how it's been up and down up and down up and down it's like kind of look like the end of the world back here nope turn around went straight back up the next day nope went right back down look like the end of the world nope almost made it all the way back to new highs nope selling off a little bit and eh, trying to make it stalling out Okay, 
Now, it is making lower lows and lower highs, which is not a good thing. But let's not get too caught up in that as long as the net net. And if you have TC, just press your C key. C is in Charlie for custom date sort. Don't actually do the sort, but just drag it across, and it gives you a measurement, 0.34%. So go all the way back to June, to where we were at the close of June 8th, three months and change, almost four months in here, or a couple of weeks away from four months at least. It's up a third of a percent. Now, if we end down another third of a percent today, we'll be down, it'll be up 0%, okay? So do pay attention to the day-to-day -day action. And we've gone mostly sideways. Now, Susan has said we haven't gone anywhere since 2015. Yeah, and that's another net net thing you can look at too. It's okay to go way back in time and and do that kind of analysis, okay? Uh, up 2.6%, let's say 2014 even. But yeah, uh, March 2015, we've had some pretty big zigs and zags in between. There's been some tradable moves in between, and we've had quite a few setups in between. But, yeah, Susan, I fully agree. There's nothing wrong with doing that type of analysis going back a couple of years. And, and if you remember, I kind of beat the dead horse. In fact, we can pull it up now in the Russell 2000 for a long, long time because it just hadn't done anything in a long, long time. Let's take a look at the weekly there. Now, it looked pretty ugly last summer. Remember, we had the weekly bow tie with everything kind of triggered right around here. And it worked out a little bit, at least on a weekly basis, okay? And we had a pretty good sell-off. That's nothing to sneeze at if we measure from, let's say, about right there down. That's an 18% sell-off from a sell signal. So that's not bad. It didn't really work out so well in the P's and the NASDAQ. And if you go back and watch some videos... Back then, you could see I was kind of bearish and a little concerned. But, yeah, net, net, we haven't made a whole lot of forward progress in a long, long time. But we did have a pretty serious sell-off, which might have provided a couple of shorts, if memory serves. I think the beginning of this year, or when were we short? We were short quite a bit, beginning of this year, I want to say, because the market was going down. And then this is a pretty good run from here to here, okay, higher. So that's not bad. But now you got to get back to the net net. Shorter term, net net, not so good in a Russell 2000. Uh, shorter term, we do have a bow tie. It's not of all time highs, but it is a bow tie nonetheless. We're down here, brand new lows. We're taking out the bottom of the range. Okay. So we might want to start to become a little bit concerned unless the market turns right back up and goes on to make new highs. Okay, so let's pay attention to what's happening here. NASDAQ composite still looks pretty good. On a relative strength basis, it looks pretty good. Greg Morris once said, though, you can't eat relative strength, and it's true. So you don't necessarily want to be in stocks that are going down the lease. You can't make any money being long stocks that are going down the lease. But it does pay to pay attention to what's going on. And NASDAQ so far kind of hanging in there. But it's getting awfully sideways. Okay, go back to August. And now we're in October. So two and a half months sideways action there. Not that far from all-time highs. Now, I don't get too excited about a market when it's just off of all-time highs. As a general statement, I like to err on the long side because what are two big up days that put you new highs? Unfortunately, though, one or two big down days now would put you at these multi-month lows, and selling can often beget more selling. Let's take a look at some of the sector action in here. Uh, some areas like insurance sideways at best. I've noticed recently health services beginning to break down in earnest in here. Looks like we have a pretty serious top that could be unfolding. Let's take a look at the transports. Transports are kind of chopping along. But what's a little bit of a bummer here is they were just beginning to break out a little bit to multi-year highs, and now they've come back in a little bit. And now we're back in, as a person I used to work with used to say, uh, back into the sideways soup. 
Metals and mining have been waking up a little bit lately, today notwithstanding. But it's not gold and silver leading the way there. The precious metals, as you can see, aren't doing so hot. I wouldn't rush out and short the metals at this juncture because, especially like gold, they're at they're relatively low levels longer term. And, yeah, you could argue that that would be a pretty good run if we went back to old lows. But I'm just not that excited about shorting the metals, at least at this juncture. I much rather prefer shorting metals when they're at multi – uh, year highs or like decade plus highs or all time highs because your opportunity is so much better. My concern here, there's always something to worry about, but my concern here now at least is that if you have some uh, things, some bad things happen in the world, that the gold stocks could have a pretty serious rally. So I'm not that excited about running out and shorting them at this juncture. Not that I'm factoring in world events or news or anything it's just that i just i'm not seeing a huge opportunity to short the goals and have them go back to their old lows in here i would much rather look for a much bigger longer term potential in a trade in fact every trade i take i hope and there's that word hope but i hope there's longer term potential banks are waking up a little bit in here the big banks not so much or not as exciting i should say as the regional banks selected regionals Banging out new highs in here. Before I forget, gold, the commodity, not looking so hot. It has quite a bit of support uh, below this level, about 115. I don't really see a, a good short in here. It's chopped around in here for quite a few days, so it's no longer set up. Longer short, short, but it's got support at 115, and then 105 would probably be major support. So I just don't see it worthwhile going after as a trade, especially in a choppy commodity. Now, when you look at some of this technology, like the NASDAQ itself, it's kind of hanging in there, such as the SIBI is not too far from not all-time highs, but highest levels is 99, so close enough for government work. That's looking okay. But unfortunately, technology, like everything else, is mixed too. Take a look at drugs. Over the intermediate term, you can see the sideways arrow goes down. I mean, I'm sorry, the arrow goes down. Over the somewhat longer term, the arrow is sideways. Biotechnology within the drugs scores a bit of a bummer. Because just a few weeks ago, it was looking fantastic, and I was starting to see some really good-looking biotech stocks. Luckily, we were super selective in here. Didn't take – I don't know if we took any of them. I don't remember. I have to look. I try to forget about a trade shortly after I take it. But you can see it's headed lower for the last month or so. Now, I don't want to rush out and short them because there's a lot of support just below the market. This does not. This is kind of electrocardiogram, as you can see. So I wouldn't rush out and short them, but you certainly want to honor your stops on any existing longs. I don't remember. No, Pi was a uh, electronic stock, I think, not a biotech. Uh, retail, getting to just sectors in general, not doing so hot. Uh, there were some conglomerates that got whacked lately. I noticed that. So big picture or big cap stocks are getting whacked a little bit. Defense stocks, though, at least yesterday, were doing okay. Coming in a little bit today, but some of the big defense stocks, Boeing and stocks like that, were breaking out now coming back in. So depends on where you look. It's really mixed, but as a general statement, I would say it's worsening. I'm not ready to rush out and start shorting a whole bunch right now, and I don't want to factor in too many uh, things, but maybe the reason we're going sideways is because the market's in a holding pattern for this stupid election that we're in, possibly. <laughs> it's like I actually turn on the news now and then I can't wait to turn it then I turn it off it's like it's it's crazy Angela says I took a trial with another guy who only trades strong edges he triggered a short in Ra or a I at 47 oof oof uh Well, that's kind of – I don't want to pick apart somebody's uh, stock after the trade, but that's a pretty choppy-looking chart. Ouch. Well, it happens, you know. I, sometimes sometimes some of my stuff gets uh, whacked. You know, it happens. All right. Um, sector action, again, mix. Let's just wrap this up real quick. Uh, utilities, interest rate-sensitive areas such as the REITs. Real Estate Investment Trust, looking a little dubious in here. Let's take a look at those real quick. 
you can see breaking down the new lows. So they're not looking so hot. If anything, look like potential shorts. Not a huge fan of shorting some of these uh, lower uh, volatility areas, at least at this juncture of the market. But certainly if you did want to go after some of the short side, I couldn't argue with that. I'm just not seeing a huge opportunity there just yet. Okay. Can we look at the 30-year bond? Absolutely. 30-year bond, I'm glad you brought it up. 30-year bond is banging out new lows in here. Now, as I often preach, and you said ZB. I don't know if I have that chart in this particular thing. No. Uh, but this will work as a proxy. TLT is what I use there. The initial, as you know, and not to make a big duh, but as bonds go down, that means rates go up because the yields go up quite a bit. But notice that we're still way up here at 130. So that means that the yields are pretty darn low. Even as we're making these multi-month lows, closing in on multi-year lows in the bond. The initial shock, it's going to be a bit of a shot across the bow, I think, with the markets. And that might be unfolding as I speak. It's going to be that people are probably going to sell stocks first and ask questions later. And I think in the asking question later, they're going to say, wait, rates are still 0.000001. Oh, they only went up a, a smidge of a smidge. Okay, well, maybe we don't have to worry about rates just yet. What level do we have to worry about them? I don't know. But in markets, it's the fear or the perception that moves the market and not the actual reality and not the actual fixed number. So in this particular case, you're going to see stocks sell off fairly hard on a bond drop, but it's not going to be a proportional reaction to what it should be. It's going to be a bit of an overreaction. So the delta scares people. The change or the delta scares people. But in reality, I think we're going to be okay with rates for a while. Rates will go higher. Rates are going higher. I don't think they're going to take stocks down right away. Yes, it's going to be a shot across the bow. But let's let's we'll know it when we see it. Let's live through that. And if the market follows through, then as a trend follower, we're not going to try to say, well, rates are still low. It can't go. Stocks can't go lower. Stocks can do whatever they want. Any market do whatever it wants, okay? Doesn't care about you, doesn't care about me, doesn't care about the guy who screams at TV. But let's just watch it unfold. So, yeah, bonds are headed lower uh, based on their current trend in here. Absolutely. All right, let's go ahead and open it up for individual stocks. Uh, Jerry wants to look at CC. This needs to go on your momentum list because... Why? Well, it's, which way is it headed? It's headed higher. So that looks pretty good. Relatively new issue, that's always a good thing. Um, you know, I have an IPO pattern that buys IPOs at new highs with quite a few caveats. And that's a short-term pattern. You would have bought it back here somewhere, which it never did trigger, okay? It just kind of died out. But I'm beginning to wonder, uh, is there something longer term in that, Okay. Is it worth buying an IPO one, two, or three years down the road? And I think there's something there. So make a little note in your notebook on keeping an eye on these things. So this is the first time this stock has hit all-time highs since its inception. So that's interesting. So sometimes, as I talked about in the IPO course, you get what I call the die in the die. And that means that an IPO comes public and immediately dies out. You don't want to try to get a mark, uh, IPO back here before it comes out. And there's a whole bunch of caveats about that. And, and it's like if you're fortunate enough to get it, then you don't want it. Okay, that's the short answer on that. We could talk quite a bit about that. But bottom line is a lot of times they come up, they price too high, they die. But then the company gets its act together. So sometimes these first emerging trend patterns could be really really good and even these longer term new highs can work out quite nicely but at this juncture i would just trade this stock within the i don't know if the word is realm but for lack of a better word within the realm of the core methodology which trades pullbacks and trending market so put this on your trending market stock list now 
for me to actually want to take this setup, it would have to accelerate higher like this and then trade that pullback. So it would have to take out this high decisively. And so far, it really hasn't done that quite yet. Okay, see, it's let's look at the net net. Remember that net net there? It rears, rears its ugly head again. So it was at 60, and it's up a little bit in here, but not much. Okay, given the volatility of the stock. So yeah, put it on your momentum list, but hang up, but hold off for now. CLD, I like, or I have liked at least. Um, but you are beginning to get a net net problem here too. But so far, it looks okay. I'm going to give you an okay on that one. Okay. But Dave, it's going kind of sideways in here from here to here. Yeah, I realize that. Okay. And that is uh, about a month of trading. But you have to decide whether or not the prior trend trumps that and the prior run from three to six that's a hundred percent run you would expect some pretty serious retracement so that one looks okay i'm not excited about rushing out and buying any stocks but that looks pretty good and the other thing that i like about this one is if you look at the uh this is one i think has been in the landry list i, I need to remember to write down my landry list before the show uh but yeah it's definitely been in the landry list for a while and I tend to try to stay off of these stocks for out of, out of courtesy for my clients. But, yeah, absolutely. It looks pretty good. Um, it's accelerating in its trend. It's pulled back a little bit. It could be a little choppy at time, but times, but that's okay. It's metals and mining. It's energy related. So commodity stocks can be um, choppy. You show a high at CC as 2250? Well, you're probably showing – I don't know what you're showing. Yeah, it's – 22.50? Well, it, that's probably, um, I don't know, what charts are, I'll look at, I'll take a look at stockcharts.com and see what it says. Okay, uh, Donna wants to know if Seas is an example of emerging trend. Sounds like a shipper. SeaWorld. Oh, SeaWorld. Okay. Okay, Karen. She's in Think of Swim. Uh, this just looks kind of choppy to me. Okay. So let me kind of pick it apart, and then I'll answer the question. You've got a mountain of overhead supply here. Now, granted, if you got it at 14 and change and it went to 18, I guess that'd be a good problem to have. But I don't want to get into a stock and make a little bit of money. I want to get into a stock and make a lot of money. I want to make sure I have clear air so I can at least make 100% on the trade if everything works out before it runs into trouble. So it looks like it could run into a lot of trouble up here. So I, I would probably, or I, quite frankly, I would immediately toss this one out based on that. Now, the question is, is this an emerging trend? Well, yeah, you bow tied off of these major lows. But then look what happened. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, forty, fifty. You got three weeks of trading where it hasn't made any forward progress. Ideally, in an emerging trend pattern, you want to see a thrust higher or some sort of major turn like a bow tie. And then you just want to see a few days of pullback in an ideal situation. doesn't mean that this stock can't go higher, and it can, but I wouldn't go after it based on the number of days in the pullback, uh, especially the number of days in an emerging trend. Okay, So I forget my exact rule because it, it varies per stock, but I think it's uh, – after seven or eight days, I begin to question the pullback because you're going a week and change, almost a two weeks in the pullback. And you've got about two weeks of pullback here. But in a, in a generic stock, in a solid established trend, after seven to eight days, I really begin to question it. In an emerging trend, I question it even sooner because if a new trend is emerging, it should pull back just a little bit and then take off. In fact, we could use that propensity to our advantage Sometimes your best trades come when you just get a tiny little pullback and then the stock takes off because the most amount of people are trapped on the wrong side of the market. Let me show you what that looks like. And this is something that I often talk about when I talk about emerging trends. So I don't know if this is going to make a slide pop up or not. Let's just see what happens. So sometimes you get a market that bottoms out like this. Let me do a bar chart. Sometimes you get a market that bottoms out and then it begins to take off. And sometimes that one little tiny pullback, that one little lower low and lower high, in some cases just a lower high, sometimes the market will do this and then skyrocket over the next few days. Not always, obviously, 
I mean, if it always did this, you never see my fat ass again. But a lot of people are waiting for that deeper pullback. They're waiting for that more perfection in the setup. But Dave, I thought you said look for perfection. Well, in this particular case, a one bar pullback is perfection. That's what you're looking for. Just some sort of little tiny pullback. You're not looking for the perfect pullback that you would look for in an established trend. So if the market takes off after just a little tiny pullback, the most amount of people are going to be trapped on the wrong side of the market. And that's when the market really take off. So when you're looking at these emerging trends and you see a trend emerge, and then you see it pull back for a week or chop around for a week or two. This is probably an emerging trend that's already ran into trouble. So I would pass just based on that. All right, let's. right, I'll start moving quicker, I promise. <laughs> ABEO, yeah, that's a trending one. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Let me see what my – let me check something out here. Do a little something off screen. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Um, It has a lot of problems way back here, but that's so far back. It looks like the personality of the stock has begun to change. So I'll give that one an okay. Uh, with today's action and all in there, it looks pretty good. This one's been on and off my list for a while now. It's on my momentum list. But, yeah, a good eye on that, Andre. Uh, it's had such a good run. You want to see even a little bit more knockout to it, uh, but it's not bad as it is. I'd like to see a little further knockout in this one, though based on the magnitude of the run from here down at three all the way up to nine. So it's already at 300%, but it's not bad. It looks pretty good. That's probably about the best you're going to find. Oh, uh, Phil, thank you, Phil. Yeah, Phil's telling me what the shorts were. M-O-H, Ozark, A-I-Z, D-Y, and C-C-L. Yeah, remember I said the market was headed lower, so we were shorting these stocks earlier this year, okay? Uh, this was one of them. Back here, that one looks a little unorthodox, but MOH, uh, you see the little arrow here. We were shorting this one back here. So, yeah, the market was headed lower. Some of these bigger cap stocks were beginning to tank, so we begin taking those shorts. And you might start seeing some of these stocks again, or stocks like these in the new list. I'm long Baba. How's it look? Uh, it looks okay. You have a stop, right? Uh, but it has lost some steam in here. Now, here's the thing. Obsess before you get to the trade, not afterwards. Haven't said that yet today? So let's say you got to stop at 95. Then what should you do? Well, nothing. Wait to see what happens. This might just be a consolidation before it takes off again. But if you're thinking about a new position here or an add-on, absolutely not, okay? Uh, a month, almost two months of trading here, sideways action, uh, seven weeks. Close enough for government work. No. It's lost steam. If you're long, stay long. But Dave, why wouldn't you exit? Well, how do you know if it's just it's just consolidating before it takes off again? But you want to look for that perfection going into a trade and then not afterwards. Okay, that's a different way of saying obsessed before. Thank you for that, Phil. Appreciate that. Selgy, TKO short at 50 day moving average now. Mr. Phil likes that 50. Um I don't like the gap, okay? Usually I don't like gaps against the trend. No, it's not a TKO because you're not in a longer-term established trend. This is kind of an electrocardiogram. I mean, I hear you. It's a downtrend here. It would be knocking out that. And I guess if you zoomed in and didn't have the gap, it would look sort of like a textbook TKO. But within the context of the bigger picture market, I would say, well, it's just stuck this chopping around, so I would leave it alone. I mean, you could be right, but I would leave it alone. C R S P crisp. Yeah, this could be a um, this could be an interesting IPO type of setup. I hear you making that new high. Um, as I said, the course, which maybe I'll put on sale this weekend. 
because it looks like some of these IPOs are still running in here. When you make the new high on the opening day, make sure that new high gets taken out on a closing basis before taking the trade. But yeah, that does look interesting. Uh, very aggressive type of trade, but yeah, absolutely. SWN, a dip worth buying. That's going to be a uh, energy stock. No, 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 no. This is not a dip that's worth buying because when I say buy on a pullback, you want that pullback, as I said a few minutes ago, to be it could be one day in like a TKO type of move or one day in something like an emerging trend like a bow tie. But if you are in an established trend, an established trend you want to, let's see if we get a blue arrow. You want to be able to draw, well, maybe not. You want to be able to draw a big blue arrow on the chart for established trends, okay? Emerging trends a little bit more difficult, but established trends, you should be able to draw a big arrow. In this case, it's red, but you get the idea. The stock should look like this, kind of like a couple of those momentum stocks that you guys were smart enough to recognize earlier. And then the pullback looks like this. It could be like a one-day big TKO type of move, or then it can unfold also under over a few days. So if you were to draw a line through the chart, it should look like that. That's what a pullback looks like. This is what an emerging trend looks like. Emerging trend kind of looks like a cup and handle type of pattern. Pullback looks like this. Draw a line like that. Draw a line like that. That's it. My work is done. Drop it in the mic as I walk off the stage. Okay? So let's take a look at that chart. Let's see what we got. Uh, no. If anything, it looks like a short. I wouldn't rush out and short it because it's – selling off at fairly low levels. So no, this is not a dip worth buying because you want a trend and then you want to look for a pullback within that trend. If anything, it's a possible short. So let's take it now. Now look, I'm not beating you. Don't email Dave, you beat me up. You know, this is, this is within my methodology. You might have your own methodology, but Looking at my methodology, this is how I, I look at things. And you can see that it's headed, it's obviously headed lower. All right, I need to pick it up here. I know, I know I'm dragging my buttocks. Arch, that's going to be a coal stock, I think. Uh, yeah, it looks fantastic um, with today's data in here. This is one I've been watching. And it's kind of interesting. It's I, I do have a rule that, an IPO rule, where I like to buy when they're below $20 a share where they show these early forms of breaking out. But I have been watching this one, and I'm wondering if, uh, in some cases, and if this IPO bull market continues, maybe we could uh, take a harder look at some of the stocks that are that are breaking out at higher levels, or higher prices, I should say. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, I think it might be worth a shot. I'm a little bit more liberal with IPOs, uh, and there's there, there's some patterns there that kind of bend my core methodology, and that's why I spent so much time in the IPO course talking about them. Um, but, yeah, as a pullback, and this is like your first uh, decent pullback, it looks okay. I like a little bit deeper pullback in here, but it's certainly not bad. You could certainly do much. There's not much out there that looks much better than this. I'm pointing to my screen like an idiot. <laughs> It, RG, I didn't mean to beat you up on an SWM. It's just it's it, I'm framing it within a trend following methodology. Okay, so it's it's me comparing against the methodology. Uh, this is a trending stock. Oh, kind of thin. This is way too thin. Uh, the problem with technical analysis with really thin stocks is, as as uh, as, uh, as Greg Morris has often talked about. You got to make sure you have a representative sample. Remember, you're looking at the emotions of the market. So you want to make sure you're representing those emotions of the market. And if it's a really thin stock, you don't you don't have enough emotions to be represented. OK, I don't want to elaborate on that too, too long because I've. But I hear you. It's making new highs, but uh, way too thin. Toss that one out, Steve. Susan wants to look at DXJ. Um. Japan Equity Fund. Oh, by the way, uh, what is it? IWZ? What's the uh, Latin America? EWZ? 
Latin America stocks have been doing pretty good in here, so make a note of that. So we could see some setups here at some point. Uh, yeah, I hear you. Looks like it looks like a major bottom is happening here. I don't see any reason to rush out and start buying them just yet, though. But if it did break out to new highs, uh, you might be onto something there. Certainly keep it on your list. ILF is Latin America. Oh, thank you, Donald. Thank you, Susan. ILF. Yeah, this is one I've been watching because it's beginning to persist higher, beginning to make some new highs in here. So keep that on your watch list. EWZ2. Thank you, Susan. Would you put Shaq on any of your watch list? Dave. S-H-A-K. Uh, no, no, no. Let's take a look at the uh, – and I'm not beating – I know Dave, it's your first time here, but uh, – or one of your first times. It's gone – uh, nine months, and it hasn't made any progress. Nine and a half months. So remember earlier I said about the debt debt thing. Um, yeah, that's not a good thing. And then over the short term, it's been headed lower. So yeah, leave that one alone. Love the food. Uh, hate the stock. EWZ is Brazil. Okay, well that's Latin America still. Cousin CZZ, CZZ. We're gonna have to go a little faster here. I realize that. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, maybe. Uh, certainly trending, certainly accelerating in the trend, certainly persisting in the trend. So not bad, not bad at all. But on a pullback or ideally a trend knockout, uh, longer term, it's not making all-time highs, but it has cleared this overhead supply. So, yeah, put that on your watch list, for sure. Yeah, MTL, that's the one I was talking about that I missed uh, and missed big. And... But looking back at the charts, you can see that I kind of picked it apart. It showed you why I didn't like it back here, okay? So I have to live with that. So trading is making decisions and living with them. And so for this one stock that was on my radar that doubled, I probably had 100 that were on my radar that have dropped significantly. So I would be losing my butt if I'd have taken all those other trades. And that's hard to see because sometimes we have this – selective perception how many times i have to tell you every thursday i do a show sorry <laughs> t t t w t t w you're welcome don uh, a little sideways in here uh, longer term you have some momentum but shorter term not so much longer term you're like wow it looks fantastic um it's a little choppy, but it is kind of a what I call a box stocks, kind of a, a la Darvis style. Google it. Um, but too much sideways action lately. So for me to get excited, what's going to have to happen? Oops. New highs decisively in a pullback. If you're long, stay long. Absolutely. So longer term trend, shorter term, not so much. FSLR worth watching? I think so. FSLR. Oh, no, too much overhead supply. Yeah, we talked about this one a couple weeks ago. So let's say you do get in, it's going to run into all this overhead supply. Now, if it clears this overhead supply, gets up above 50 bucks a share, check back with me. Okay, I'll change my mind on that. Okay, Don wants to – okay, we talked about that one. Uh, LNTH, yeah, that's when it's ticking off, LNTH. Um but as I said a while back, I didn't like this gap down. And then you could see short to intermediate term sideways in here. Let's draw a little uh, line. Well, that's a 10% move, but still, it's a, it's a, HV is kind of crazy. You can see right around 850, right around 850. You get the idea. Uh, that would have to break out to new highs and then pull back for me to get excited. Ren, R-E-N. Let me get to some new people too, uh, Andre. I'll come back to you after this one. Yeah, this looks good. We talk about this one. This one's been on my one of my lists for quite a while. It needs a little bit more pullback, but yeah, put that on your watch list. Absolutely. Good eye on that one, Andre. Uh, Jim wants to know about PBR. I'd love a PBR. Could you go get me one? <laughs> I saw a PBR. I put it on my Facebook page. By the way, if you're not my Facebook friend, I'd love to have you. Um, I want to be like John Bollinger and make a post. I have too many friends. I don't have that problem yet. I don't have enough friends, so be my friend. I think I have some links on my website. If not, I think I'm 9,400 uh, is what my number is, uh, or 94,000. PBR, uh, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Nice persistent trend moving higher. But I saw PBR. There was PBR in a in a grocery store in uh, Hong Kong, which I thought was interesting. Celgy type of chart. Yeah, we talked about that one. Okay. 
All right, let me clean up some of these other ones. Bob wants to know about WM. That's like waste management, right? That's going to be too big and too thick and too choppy, if I had to guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, you look at your HV. It's 13. Where's the spiders right now? 16? 10. Okay, 10. Where's the NASDAQ? NASDAQ is 12. So it's very low in volatility. Uh, it was 68 way back in July. Now it's 62. So it took it uh, how many months to move? How much? Let's just measure this for S and G's. Six uh, percent in six months. <laughs> um, if anything, I think it looks like it's in trouble longer term. It looks like a possible short, but a little too um, too thick, too choppy. And let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Too many days in the pullback if you look at the short. It so I'd stay away from that one. I I V I. We're trying to find uh, stuff that can really move. Okay, we don't want to be in stuff that doesn't move that much. Uh, this looks good. This should belong in your momentum list. A little wide and loose way back here, but it looks like it's got its act together. Uh, possibly on a pullback. Absolutely, put that in your momentum list. You're welcome, Bob. I hope I'm not beating anybody up too much today. BV, but I'm trying to get everybody to learn. First thing I see with uh, this one is you do have a lot of overhead supply way back here. Um, and then I decide based on that, what's the shorter term action. But shorter term, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. It's got about 18 days in the pullback, so too many days in the pullback. Uh, it still looks like a bottom to me, but I wouldn't rush out and buy it, especially with now – based on the fact that this doesn't look fantastic, based on the amount of overhead supply. So I would leave that alone. T-S-R-O for Mr. Steve, T-S-R-O. Uh, let's see. Well, shorter term, it's going kind of sideways. Yeah, it was kind of off to the races back here, but that was just one day. One big update plus the gap or whatever, or one just big update, period. So, yeah, I would have to make new highs and then pull back for me to get excited. Ren, we already covered, AJ. We liked it, I think, if memory served. Uh, watch the rerun on YouTube. TOS for Karen. is Oh, okay, TOS platform. Yeah, I'll could, we could confirm that somewhere else. But sometimes you get like a, a pricing. Some data feeds will put the pricing on the IPOs. And I'm not defending Thinkorswim or um, – Telechart, I'm not sure who's got it right, but sometimes they'll put that pricing as as the opening tick, and that's it, that's not correct. You want the pricing to be where you actually have trading. Rin looks okay. It would take a little bit more knockout for me to get excited about it, but certainly looks okay. Put it on your watch list, and I think it certainly is on mine. A little wide and loose longer term, but looks like lately it's beginning to uh, rally. Felp I like. I think I like it. Keep in mind, I really don't have any stocks that I'm going after lately. But, yeah, this one's on my watch list. On a pullback, absolutely. Okay. AMRS. We've got about uh, a few minutes left. Just time for a few more. Uh this one looks like it has a lot of overhead supply to deal with, a lot of trading back here. So I would leave it alone based on that. It is kind of a cheap stock, so that's always something to think about. Maybe on a pullback for a swing trade, but you don't want to limit yourself longer term. I think longer term it could have a lot of uh, stuff to go through. Carol wants to know about MIME. MIME. Is this new Carol or old Carol? We had a Carol that was around years ago. And then we have some new carols. Um, yeah, this needs to go on your watch list. I want to pull back, absolutely. This is the old carol. Well, welcome back, carol. Good to see you. You still have your dog? I forget the name. That dog's got to be about 30 years old now. You still have the dog? <laughs> I got a dog that's getting really old. I'm like, please die. <laughs> Poor little fella. He's going blind. We're tripping over him. Oh, man. He's getting good tankerous. He barks at things he can't hear. Oh. <laughs> Good for you, Don F. Are you serious? Is it real? Is that real? Is that old Don or new Don? 
Uh, AM's breaking out to new highs. It's kind of wide and loose longer term, so it would have to keep breaking out and then pull back for me to get excited about it. Uh, old Don. Well, hey, old Don. Glad to have you back. We beat we beat Don up in here so much, and he still comes back for more. It's kind of like the, the hunter where the bear keeps uh, taking advantage of him. And the bear finally says, you're not in for hunting, are you? No, it's just all over the place, Don. Why would you want to buy Ford? He loves Ford. I don't, I don't get it. Um, no, it has nothing to do with my methodology. It's big. It's thick. Uh, HV is fairly low. It chops around. So poor Don. 14 years old. Well, shoot, my, my dog's getting up there too. AM for Don. Another Don. New Don. Uh, yeah, keep this on your watch list. It looks like it's just beginning to break out in here. Uh, certainly on a pullback, absolutely. Some of these energies are beginning to get their act together. Here's another case where uh, it's a, what I call a toddler, an IPO of not that long ago, a couple years ago, breaking out the new highs. So, yeah, put that on your watch list on a pullback. Is WFC about to hit resistance? RG, WFC. <laughs> you just want to make my day with Ford? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're, you know, if you're scalping it in and out or doing some choppy trading or reversing, I mean, that's fine. It's, it's not my cup of tea, but um, – what was the question on this one? Yeah, it's about to hit resistance. Absolutely. Yeah, good eye on that one as far as there's just nothing to do here because it's a big choppy stock. If you want to trade a bank, maybe look at a regional bank instead of Wells Fargo. But up or down, it looks like it's in trouble longer term. Okay, I wouldn't trade it. IRBT for Steve. Uh, maybe on a pullback. This one's kind of crazy. Uh, longer term, could be a little wide and loose. I'm not a huge fan of stocks that make a one-day big, huge move and then just kind of chop around. So it would have to continue higher and prove itself for me to get started. CZZ and a bigger pullback. That's going to be Cousins. Did we talk about that one? Seems like we did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we talked about it, Ethan. Uh, rewind uh, uh, the, the recording once I get it up on YouTube. Sierra and Tilly. You know, it's time for just a few more. And I, I know there's some of you guys are still waiting on a few. I'll try to get to you. CRNT, no. Um, you know, here's your net net issue. Uh, it was at on 9.6, it was up around 270. And now there it is right around 270, 260 on 1027. So that's what, a month? Almost two months? Yeah, there's nothing there. And then you could even go back further in time if you wanted to. So, yeah, wait for it to break out the new highs and it'll play some pullbacks maybe. TSRO for Steve. TSRO. We have a lot of Steves and Dons in here today. And we have old Carol. She's not that old, though. Old in that she's been around the Dave Landry stuff for a while. Uh, a little sideways in here. Wait to see if it could break out the new highs and then maybe look to play pullbacks on that. P10 for Greg. I think we're same age. I don't remember. Uh, this is an oil field stock. It's not bad. It did it did break out of this base. I would like to see it have cleared this base. I'm going to pass, but you could certainly do much worse, especially in this market. I would like to see it clear this base a little bit more decisively, but it's certainly a not bad. You could certainly, again, do much worse. Um, if you did take the trade, if you pulled back to the base, say around 20 or whatever, you'd have to admit that you're wrong, which is fine. I mean, that's that's not bad for a trade. CECO. Yeah, it's going to be an educational stock. I'm not a huge fan of educational stocks, but they're taking off. So there's a dilemma. Do I go after them or not? Um, probably not. But, uh, yeah, it's going to have to keep breaking out for me to get excited about it. I don't know why educational stocks are taking off. It doesn't matter, right? TSLA, Tesla. Nice ogre in action. A couple of ticks, though. So. Yeah, I mean, it's not my style of trading, but certainly if you wanted to trade opening gap reversals, that's kind of an interesting opening gap reversal. I hear you. Q-I-B-R-Q. O-I-B-R. Oops. OIBR. I think it's OIBR.Q. OIBR.Q. All right, Don, catch you later.
Okay, I can't pull that one up. Uh, CRNT. Rick was asking about CNX. We're long CNX right now. Uh, not much lately. It hasn't done that so well lately. But we're in longer term trend following mode. No, uh, CRNT, it would have to break out to new highs and stay there. Uh, another case of, yeah, we just talked about this one. Uh, okay. Uh, C, CNX. We're long this stock right now. Um, it's finding a little support to the bottom in range. I wouldn't rush out and buy it, but as a longer term trend follower, we're staying with it. Well, Dave, it's gone sideways quite a while. Well, we hadn't gotten stopped out. Okay. And so far, the stock has turned into the aforementioned Darvis stock where it triggered a bow tie back here. We got a little profit out, chopped around, chopped around, took off, chopped around, chopped around, took off, chopped around, chopped around, rinse and repeat. If you can keep doing that, then that's fine. Well, Dave, why would you buy a stock like this? Well, we bought it back here when it was more perfect, okay, and looked fantastic. And the metals and mining, specifically energy-related metals and mining, were doing great. Now, not so much, but so what? We have a stop in place. We'll get stopped out, make, uh, I don't know, 70 80%, better than the poke in the eye, okay? But no, not as a new setup, not right now. Even though I'm long, you know, I should be like, oh, man, it's the greatest thing ever. But no, absolutely not right now. But if it makes new highs on pullbacks, absolutely. Well, look, I'm out of time. I appreciate you guys and girls coming. Thank you so much for uh, being here. I'm humbled by your presence. Any unanswered questions, feel free to shoot me an email, David Dave Landry. Dot com. We're going to talk again between now and the weekend. Everybody enjoy your weekend. Happy Halloween. <laughs> and uh, I guess we'll talk again. Uh, I'll see you guys again and girls next uh, Thursday. Thank you so much.